L let me show you here where this is showing up amongst, again, evangelical leaders that I used to endorse. I keep mentioning Thabiti Anyabwile here. Thabiti was a guy, again, I would, have, I would have given you one of his books 10 years ago had I met you. I would have recommended him to you 10 years ago. I really liked Thabiti Anyabwile. And uh, now, uh, I mean, you can see in his, behind him on the bookshelf is Woke Church. He's got Ibram X. Kendi's book, Stand from the Beginning. He's got all these woke books behind him on the bookshelf, and he's preaching. This is actually during COVID lockdown, I believe. He's preaching uh, via live stream to his church. I want to show you a couple of clips to show you. This is a guy who used to speak it together for the gospel. This guy was a pastor with Mark Dever at in Washington, D.C., uh, 15 or so years ago, and was a leader in the reform movement. And now listen to the things that, that he's getting at here in his sermon. I'm going to show you two clips. This has been my experience, that, that among such people, there is this desire to exonerate themselves from racial injustice. And I have to say, that's not just Coates' experience, that's my experience too with, with white sons and daughters of Adam. Not all, but way too many. And certain fundamentalist Christians and evangelical Christians are the worst at this. That desire to exonerate themselves of all things racist, of all things racial injustice, it, it tempts them to deny then all things that are racist. The result again is that they become indifferent to the black body and the blood of black people spilled in the streets, even when it's caught on camera. Even when the eye is telling you that injustice has happened plainly, the heart of indifference must die with every person killed in their homes and every person choked to death on the streets and every little boy playing with a toy gun shot in the park. Indifference must die. In now, now let me just say here, and this goes back to a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the Black Lives Matter movement. I can promise you, I am not indifferent to these stories. I've shed tears over some of these stories that I've looked at online. I'm not saying that. Here's, here's the notion, though. What he's assuming is that there is a, remember, a systemic targeting of black bodies. That's his assumption. He's saying, why don't you care about the black blood spilled on the ground? I'm saying, I am not indifferent to that. Mm. I care about that. I really do. I sincerely do. But he just mentioned, remember, a, boy, a black boy in the park with a toy gun. Remember he just mentioned that? We covered that story in here, what, two weeks ago? And remember what I said? When Washington Post did a two-year search on individuals who are killed with toy guns, nearly three times as many white people were killed with toy guns than black people between 2014 and 2016. So I'm not indifferent to any of those stories, and I'm not even saying every single time it's un an unjustified shooting because if they have a toy gun and you don't know and they're aiming it at you and you're a police officer, what choice do you have to make in that moment? It's a difficult decision. So I'm not saying that they're all unjustified inherently. I'm simply saying... He is assuming that this is massively discriminatory between the two ethnicities, and that uh, is not correct. Reflections, and I got another clip on here um, as well. Well, I mean, again, uh, in light of what we said, we don't have to rehash all that, but we actually looked at the statistics, like you were saying, and that's not representative of a whole big thing that's going on in the country. Mm -hmm. It's just not. Um, and so the only way this kind of mentality keeps gaining ground is we as we don't question it we assume that it's true and that when they say like kids with toy guns when you say it that way you're making an assumption that that's happening a lot of places quite frequently all over the country and it's like that's just not true like there is no reality behind that statement again anytime it happens it's tragic we should weep it should break our hearts but it's not indicative of something that's going on all the time everywhere. The facts say something entirely different. And so the whole emotional force of that, that he's trying to get to, to bring guilt over, well, you don't take racism seriously enough because this is happening everywhere all the time. It's false guilt. It's absolutely false guilt. And we should not take that upon ourselves as a burden that we have to bear if the burden itself isn't based on truth. We just don't do that. God calls us to be a people of the truth. And if we find, if you can, you can show with evidence that, hey, somebody has done wrong or you are in error in this, then we own it. We absolutely own it. But when it's, when it's this kind of blanket statement, this happened everywhere all the time. No, it's not. And so that's just factually inaccurate. And, and what makes this, again, this, this is even more troubling, I think, is the next part of this message. So he's quoting about Cain and Abel, right? Now, you might guess where he's going to go, but just let me read the text here. Remember, Cain says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. 
Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me shall kill me. Now listen to what Thabiti says about that text, applying it to this issue. Tell me if you think this is correct. Ain't that something? Did you get that? He just murdered his brother. And God now has given his judgment. And he's whining about his judgment. He's complaining. The punishment is too much. He wants a light sentence. He's whining that he's been driven from the face of God, but he wasn't living quorum Deo before the face of God. He's worried that someone might do to him what he has just finished doing to Abel. He's not repentant. He's self-pitying. Listen to me. If you listen to the conversations around racial injustice today, you will hear the voice of Cain. Now, b- before I play further, this is important because <clears throat> that's a pretty severe accusation to say people who talk the way he's about to say are speaking as Cain. Now, remember, Cain is the archetypal unbeliever in the Bible. In 1 John 3, it says, if you are like Cain, you are not a believer. And if you're like Abel, you're like a believer. So they represent the believer and the unbeliever. So he's about to say, people who say what he's about to say, he calls speaking in the voice of Cain, which is like an unbeliever, quite an accusation because I'm in the category of people he's about to name. So listen to what he's saying. This is the voice of Cain. You will hear people who oppose racial injustice saying, the remedy is way greater than I can bear. How many times you hear that in a conversation about reparations? Oh, that's going to cost too much. You hear people say, we, we can't fix this problem or, or that problem because it's, it's too impractical. And on and on it goes. Beloved, it's just the echo of Cain's voice. It's just the echo of a brother refusing to care for the murdered in the streets. Wow. I mean, I know he says it very calmly, but that is an amazing accusation. He says that if a professing Christian says reparations, the way he's talking about, is not a good idea, they are speaking with the voice of Cain, the archetypal unbeliever, and that they are, in some sense, culpable for blood on the ground. Now, here's the problem. We all agree Cain deserved the punishment. Cain deserved a far worse punishment, right, than he got. But Cain deserved the punishment he got. But you know why he deserved it? Because he did it. He murdered his brother personally. Remember, we talked about justice is uh, proportional and truthful. The last one was direct. The person who did the crime is the person who is accountable for the crime. Reparations say the great ancestors of the people who are guilty are accountable for the crime. That is a very different view than biblical justice. So if, if your great, 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 great grandfather murdered Abel, does that mean you have to atone for the sins or pay for the sins yourself? No, that's not correct. The only time that that would be true in the Bible, just want to be consistent here, is the imputed guilt of Adam. That's the only exception to this. We do believe that we are guilty in Adam. That's original sin. But outside of Adam's original sin, we are not guilty for the particular sins of our ancestors. And to say that we're indifferent to the blood on the ground because of that is not true. I'm almost done. Got a few more seconds of this clip. I want Greg to respond. Pitying himself, worried about his losses, when he's standing knee deep in blood soaked ground. See, beloved, we we cannot have the perpetrators of injustice centering themselves in conversations about the redress of injustice. We we can't have the the ones who perpetrate the crime sort of saying, oh, ah, no, that's too much. How about this? That's too much. No, no, no. They don't get to set those terms. Greg, how would you respond? You are real. You can only be like responsible for what you do what you do and what I think that's the the irony of of what he's talking about is he's applying Cain and Abel to supposed white supremacy and systemic injustice in our land today Um, and so that means if, if if what he's saying is true and I don't think it is then you are guilty of the black people who were killed because you're white and you share in a system of white supremacy. And if you're not seeking to overturn that, then you're supporting it. And therefore, in some way, you are guilty of the murder of anyone who is unjustly taken, whose life is unjustly taken. The problem with that is, is Cain directly killed Abel. Directly. Um, And see, here's the thing. He couldn't pay Abel back. Abel was dead. So, I mean, you just look at the facts of, of, of the story and it doesn't line up. Um, it, it just doesn't line up. 
And again, the assumption there, you know, it's a modern way of saying this. It's like, you know, tell, tell, tell me I'm an unbeliever without telling me I'm an unbeliever is basically what he did. Um, if you're speaking with the voice of Cain, you're speaking with the voice of a murderer um, and the one whom, as Mark said, is, is representative of an unbeliever. So he's subtly implying that if you don't go along with what he's saying, then he could legitimately say you're an unbeliever because you have the same attitude Cain did. And again, that, that is taking Scripture um, and dealing with Scripture in a very imbalanced and unfaithful way to what the text is actually saying. You have to take an agenda and a framework ahead of time, come to that text, and then read that text in light of that framework in order to say what he's saying. You get rid of the framework and you let the text stand on its own, and it disappears what he said. It just absolutely disappears. No, that, that's a good point. And it, it, at the end of the article, Kevin DeYoung writes this. He says, one, he talks about their vision of the future, and he says, it's one that ultimately depicts a future where, the, where white guilt never dies and where the reparations never end. And that's his conclusion. White guilt never dies, reparations never end. And people said, oh, come on. Well, then this video comes out, and this is a guy who is not a nobody. He's involved with uh, Wheaton College, I believe. What's his name? His name is Daniel Yang uh, with the Send Institute, which is connected to NAM, North American Mission Board, and it's also connected to Wheaton College's Billy Graham Center with Ed Stetzer. This guy's not a nobody, the guy on the right. And listen to what he says here about reparations uh, never ending. Repairing disparities is an ongoing posture. How long do we have to do this? For as long as it takes. How long do we have to do this? Until Jesus comes. So how long do we have to do reparations? Until Jesus comes back. So Kevin DeYoung said, it's going to never, if you buy into this premise, it's never going to end. And then the people come out and go, yeah, that's right. We don't ever want it to end. 